privilege to welcome to our series today's guest, Patrick Alloway, one of the country's most highly respected and experienced company directors and businessmen. Patrick, great to have you on our program. Let's just, uh, start with the, the current environment. What's your sort of handle on Australia's economy at the moment? What are the key markers that you're looking at? Thanks, Rob. It's my pleasure to be here. So thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Um, look, it's, there's lots of reasons to be negative at the moment, but I, I might just start by focusing on the positives. Um, Australia has been very resilient. Uh, we saw that through the GFC. Uh, we've seen it through the recovery from COVID. And I think if you compare the Australian economy to Europe and, and the US at the moment, we're in pretty good shape. So we've really had really strong growth coming out of COVID, really good in unemployment. Um, uh, so you know, we're down below uh, levels that we've seen for 50 years uh, from an employment perspective. We've got uh, good investment in infrastructure and construction going on uh, across the economy. Corporate balance sheets are in good shape. Consumer savings are at, at really high levels. Uh, so there's a lot to be optimistic about. But clearly, obviously, you know, we've got inflation across the world uh, growing, cost of living going up. Uh, we've seen the bottom of the interest rate cycle um, and uh, interest rates are certainly rising. And you know, we've had a huge stimulus um, through COVID um, from central banks and that's being reversed. And uh, people are very concerned about um, increase in cost of living and whether we're going to get equivalent wage growth uh, to, to cover that. So there are concerns. Um, you know, asset prices are high. Um, we've got very high leverage in the economy, um, particularly from a consumer perspective. Um, and clearly, you know, if central banks do go too hard, you know, we could see uh, the growth that we're seeing at the moment um, uh, reverse and we could potentially go into recession in one to two years' time. My, my sense is that central banks are going to be balanced. You know, we're seeing the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, being very measured uh, in their response to inflation. And you know, I think it's a, going to be a difficult balance between ensuring that they um, stem the growth of inflation, but, the but at the same time not undermine growth in the economy. Now, as you know, we're, we're under new management as of last weekend at a, at a federal government level. I won't get you to comment on the change in government, but I'd be interested to get an understanding of what you see are the, the implications of the change of government, if at all. Look, I don't think there are any major implications for the economy. You know, the policies of uh, the two major parties are very similar. Um, I think certainly um, the new government will be very focused on cost of living. Uh, and, you know, the real issue for us, uh, I think, as we go forward is Clearly we need to see wage rises and we need to see some more wage inflation. We haven't seen wage inflation in Australia for a long time, but we need productivity to be combined with that. So look, I, I don't see any, any major change. Um, you know, I think there's a clear message from the electorate uh, to politicians to listen to the issues in the community. And you know, so we've seen the core sort of vote for both the major parties uh, down um, and the rise of um, some very good independents. Uh, and I think that balance in the parliament will be a good thing with more representation for, for community interests. We've seen this rising interest rate and inflation environment right across the world here in Australia, obviously New Zealand, in the UK, the US, Europe and so forth. Where, where do you see that heading over the next two to three years? So look, globally, I, I think it's more problematic. I mean, we've, we've certainly got supply chain issues. We've got labour shortages and they're, they're, they're big issues uh, in the global economy at the moment. Uh, my sense is that in the US where you've got inflation hitting 9%, uh, in Europe where you've also got very high inflation, it's also been driven by the geopolitical issues, um, uh, in particular respect to energy prices being impacted by Russia's invasion of U Ukraine. It's going to be very difficult for them to manage because both their economies are still fragile. Um, you know, they're still recovering uh, from the abrupt hit of COVID. Uh, so my sense is that we are going to see uh, a slowdown offshore. From Australia's perspective, I think we're in a much better position. You know, our inflation rates are probably half what we're seeing in Europe and the US. I think our economy is benefiting from high commodity prices. Uh, we've got sectors in our economy that are really strong. Um, and so my sense is that uh, we will show a lot more resilience in trading through this. So we've spoken about the, the challenges. What do you see the, the opportunities for growth? What are the growth industries, do you think? Well, look, I think food and agri um, uh, is absolutely prime uh, for us at the moment. Uh, there's, a, there's a short of agricultural land around the world. There's a food shortage around the world. You know, we're very well positioned to continue to uh, export and feed the world from that perspective. Uh, our resource sector is very strong. We're seeing commodity prices at record levels um, 
uh, across a number of commodities, in particular the green, the green commodities and green resources, uh, which are in short supply. So, you know, they, they're both very strong growth sectors. I think they will continue to be strong. The energy sector uh, is really strong as well. And I think if you go away from commodities and resources, you know, you know, health will continue to be a really strong sector. We've seen, you know, a number of Australian companies do exceptionally well globally. We've got a very strong health sector in Australia, and it's a big growth area uh, from, from Australia's perspective. Uh, infrastructure growth, um, uh, so spending and infrastructure and the commitment to infrastructure is strong with a very big pipeline of infrastructure spending. And I think if you come to the service in industry across Australia, you know, we certainly the finance industry is in good shape, uh, bank balance sheets have never been stronger, very high capital levels, but services across most sectors in Australia uh, will continue to be strong. As you know, de depending on who you speak to, I know some of the, the private equity groups in particular are concerned about a risk of a global recession within the next 18 to 24 months. Is, is that something that you see in your assessment at all? Look, I think that's certainly a possibility and it really depends on how hard the central banks go to tame inflation and whether well, this is an, in an interim issue with supply chain and labour shortages or whether this is a long-term issue for the global economy. I mean, my sense is that um, uh, central banks will balance. Uh, their response. Um, they can't afford to have a major, major disruption and correction in asset prices. Uh, in particular in Australia, if you look at actually home ownership, uh, it's the major source of wealth for Australians and that would significantly impact consumer confidence if we had a, a crash or a bursting of an asset bubble in, in home prices. We certainly had fabulous growth and really strong capital growth uh, across that sector. Uh, there's no doubt we're going to see a correction, but um, you know, if uh, we put on the brakes too hard, there's a risk that uh, we could go into recession. My sense is that um, you know, the Reserve Bank is being very balanced about its approach and I think is very conscious of ensuring that um, it doesn't undermine growth in the economy. So I, I think we will get through this. There's no question we will have a slowdown. There's no question that we're going to see some correction in asset prices. We've, you know, we've had low interest rates fuel very high asset prices, and that's not just in property, it's across all assets. You know, we're seeing in those assets, particular tech stocks that aren't producing cash flows, that have had very high valuations, very large corrections in prices. But um, you know, I think that's just a rebalancing after a very strong run fueled by very low interest rates. Before we move on, from a, a macro perspective, the banking industry has undergone significant change in recent years, arising particularly from the Hain Royal Commission and, and other issues. How has the, the banking industry adapted to, to some of these changes? Look, I think it's adapted well. I mean, it was a, a very important wake-up call uh, for the industry. You know, conduct was at the heart of the issue and integrity was at the heart of the issue. And so when you actually looked at uh, culture, governance and remuneration systems, uh, they were not balanced to drive good conduct. Um, we've seen significant regulation in response to that and, and the banks have responded. Uh, so we've had enormous cultural transformation programs across the finance sector, banks and insurance companies, uh, really focused on the customer uh, and um, ensuring that the customer voice is at the forefront of every decision. And I think uh, pre hain that certainly wasn't the case. We've certainly had uh, strengthening of governance, but in particular non-financial risk governance. So most governance was focused on financial risk. Um, and you know, if you ask most boards uh, across banks at the moment where they spend most of their time, it's actually on non-financial risk uh, issues. And you know, they're the soft issues which are so important to ensuring that um, you know, the customer uh, is at the forefront uh, of the culture in the organisation. Uh, and then we've ch had changes in REM practices as well. So REM was certainly driving wrong behaviours and there wasn't enough consequence management uh, with regard to remuneration as well. So, you know, there's been an enormous change uh, through the industry. My sense is it's sustainable. Uh, and I think coming into COVID, it was very timely um, because, you know, I think the banks um, were able to, to regain a lot of trust in their response to um, uh, their customers not being in a position to meet their obligations. Um, so you know, I think Team Australia being the banks and the regulators and the government getting together to agree that they weren't going to question anyone who wanted to defer their loan, uh, who wasn't in a position to pay, 
uh, and you know, 18% of banks' books, up to 18% of banks' books were on deferral. Now we've come through two years and we're back down to less than 1% of banks' books being on deferral. So I think that behaviour, ensuring that you do the right thing by your customer, probably Hain was very helpful in bringing banks on that journey. You were appointed chairman of the Bank of Queensland in 2019. Take me through your ascension to the role and then once you became chairman, what, what were some of the key objectives that you wanted to achieve? So look, I joined about mid-2019, so it was well post Hain. The bank uh, was looking for a chair succession at the time, uh, had a couple of internal candidates, so I came on as a potential chair. Uh, I was fortunate to be appointed chair in October of, of that year. And I think the sort of core focus for the bank at that time was it recognised it needed to change. And so we actually had a change in chair leadership and CEO leadership at the same time, which is very unusual. So George Frazes uh, came on as the CEO um, around about the same time that I was appointed as chair. That gave us a, a really important change agenda for the organisation. And there were probably five aspects to that. One was re to re return the bank to profitable growth. The bank had been in decline for about five years. Um, the retail bank had been going backwards. Um, so there was a key focus on how do we return this organisation to growth and, and profitable growth, providing better returns for all of our stakeholders. Uh, I think the second piece to it was just the legacy systems and technology in the organisations. And like many organisations, there was a, a, an investment deficit um, in technology. The bank had bought many businesses but never integrated them. So we've been on a program of significant digital transformation to move very old, uh, complex legacy systems that don't speak to each other to a digital bank which is cloud-based uh, across one platform. That doesn't happen overnight. We're two years into that program. It's a five-year program. But uh, you know, we're building an end-to-end -end digital bank um, which will drive both efficiencies internally but much better customers' experiences at um, their digital interaction with the bank as well. How do you ensure when you're making that technology investment that, that you are on track, on budget and going to achieve the outcomes? There's a, another bank that I, I won't name but they've been canned in the press for, for their transformation. So how do you ensure that the, the investment that you're making is actually going to achieve the outcomes that you said you were going to? Look, those, those transformations aren't easy, they're difficult um, and, uh, and there are hurdles along the way as well. I think the key thing is that having a governance program uh, that provides transparency of reporting uh, against the roadmap. So you know, whilst it's a, it's a very bold plan, we're spending over half a billion dollars, um, uh, which is about 10% of our market capitalisation um, over a five year period, uh, sequencing the rollout of that program um, and ensuring that you meet the investment case and deliver on, on budget and on plan and meet the outcomes as you go is absolutely key. So the board oversight of that is important. We have uh, developed a, we have a technology and transformation committee that oversees that um, uh, for the board. Um, so it's a board committee, a subcommittee of the board, and its core focus is governance of that, that, uh, that program and ensuring that we actually are getting the return uh, from the investment that we're making. And then on the, the competition front, as you know, we've seen the rise of some of these upstart banks, 86400, Judo Bank and, and others. How do you ensure that the Bank of Queensland is going to remain in, in a competitive position? Look, I think you've, you've certainly got to be um, uh, aware that disruption is all around us. So you've got to continue to question the status quo. Um, so business as usual, for most industries now, but including the bank in this industry, is not uh, acceptable anymore. Um, and I think for those businesses, and you've seen it in media, um, you see it in retail, those businesses that don't respond um, ultimately don't, they have that Kodak moment where they don't have a franchise. So certainly from our perspective, you know, banks have always felt they, they're protected by regulation, but we're seeing on the fringe of banking disruption uh, going uh, from non-banks um, uh, happening every day. Um, and buy now, pay later was you know, one of those one of those aspects of, of disruption. So from our perspective, I think that the, the real questions for us are what are the key consumer trends that we're seeing? And digitisation has accelerated enormously through COVID, and it's uh, it's not going to slow down. So you know we've had demographics that have never inter interacted di digitally with organisations that are now totally comfortable doing that. 
So, you know, I think the core focus for us is that we recognise that the world is going digital uh, and the battleground is going to be personalising uh, the customer experience in a seamless way across all channels. But customers want to deal with you on, on any device, on any app, at any time, 24-7. Um, uh, but they also want to be able to speak to people uh, and they want the personal touch as well. So providing that cross-channel opportunity, uh, but with a very, very much a digital bank, but a data-led bank as well. So you know, data is so important now to ensuring that you're not just spraying your customers with irrelevant information, that in fact when a customer contacts you, uh, you know who they are, uh, you have all of their information at hand, and you can actually personalise that experience. Now we're not there yet, but we recognise that's where we need to be. Uh, and I think uh, someone starting with a blank sheet of paper as a small innovative fintech, it's much easier to get there because you're not dealing with legacy. Uh, the complexity for banks is they're dealing with legacy platforms. So look, I think that's, that's, that's important and that's a, that's a really important piece. I think we've got to recognise also that um, you know, cash is gone. We're going to end up with digital currencies which will be regulated. Um, you know, we're going to end up uh, with... Uh, people having the ability to go to marketplaces to get their financial services um, and so providing very fast, efficient um, responses uh, to your customers uh, is going to be absolutely key but also uh, price competitive responses as well because we're seeing transparency in price across all industries now becoming a commodity. Everyone knows what the price is uh, so it really comes down to service. Uh, uh, the quality of the product that you're delivering and trust. Um, so you know, we are very focused on disruption. Uh, we accept that we can't continue to do what we're doing and we're thinking about what is this organisation going to look like in 2030 and what are the key initiatives that we need to pursue to ensure that uh, we continue to evolve. Just on digital currencies and, and cryptocurrencies in particular, does the bank have a view on, on where that's headed? Yeah, look, I, I wouldn't say it's a bank view. I've got a sort of personal view. So I, I, I think let's separate digital currencies from crypto. You know, we will move to a world where central banks and regulators um, move to digital currencies. Um, in my view, I think that's a, that's a given. Um, you know, the cryptocurrency world at the moment still has many, many issues. You know, they are not, there's not a lot of utility uh, with many uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, so uh, unless they're used in everyday transactions, um, uh, rather than being spec speculative uh, mechanisms or uh, being used for the black market, um, I think it's going to be very hard for many of those currencies to be legitimised. Uh, but there's no question that blockchain, which sits behind that, which is the central ledger, um, uh, is absolutely the way of the future and we are going to see digital currencies evolving. Uh, as to whether it's um, Bitcoin or Ethereum or some of the smaller currencies, I don't know. Um, and there's no doubt that they're extremely volatile. Um, you know, uh, there's a view that some of your assets need to be in this asset class, but there's also a counter view that um, basically it's a pyramid system and it's, um, you know, at some stage it's going to collapse. I don't know, uh, but my sense is it will evolve to a utility and we will be using digital currencies to buy and sell assets um, and store value. Changing tack, the, the business acquired ME Bank at the beginning of last year in a $1.3 billion transaction. Take me through the, the strategic impetus for this transaction and, and what you see as a sort of long-term alignment between both organisations. Yeah, look, it's been a fabulous acquisition for us. You know, we, we talked earlier about growth and returning the bank to growth. Uh, we have a multi-brand strategy. Um, so you know, MeBank really fitted well within the multi-brand strategy. It's another important brand for us, which differentiates. Uh, there was no customer overlap um, with our customer base uh, from, from that perspective. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we actually diversified our portfolio more, that we had... Um, you know, a good mix between our retail bank and business bank business and what MeBank did was gave us a 50-50 mix in our portfolio across business and, and, and the retail bank. Um, scale is really, really important in banking. Uh, you will see the large banks have a cost to income ratio in the 40s, the regional banks have a cost to income ratio in the 50s and smaller banks have even higher cost to income ratios. 
as I said earlier, we're making a big investment in technology um, and uh, scale enables you to, to actually make that investment uh, and provide benefits. The other is there's enormous synergy benefits of, of bringing the two organisations together. We've got, you know, we've given the licence back, so we're down to one, one licence. Uh, we have one board, uh, we have one management team, we have one central overhead. So if you think about our strategy, we're building a, central, a digital central hub in one platform that will service multi-brands and those brands will have unique customer propositions in demographics that we think we can compete and win. Um, and obviously we're coming from a small scale, so we think there's a great opportunity to take market share across those particular brands. As you're aware, there's been significant M&A activity over the past two, or two, two to three years. What's, what's the bank's appetite like for further acquisitions? Do you see similar targets to ME Bank on the horizon at all? So look, there's nothing on the immediate horizon at the moment. We're betting down an important acquisition and uh, you know, we asked our investors to give us, as you said, $1.3 billion to, to fund that. We've got to show them that we can integrate um, and achieve the synergies and achieve the growth and benefits um, from that acquisition. You know, we took the keys uh, to, to MeBank in July last year, so we're about nine months in. Um, uh, so I, you know, I think we've got a lot of work to do at the moment to to actually proof up our strategy and deliver against that strategy. But certainly I think consolidation will, will continue in the marketplace. Um, you know, we do want to be a player uh, in consolidation. You know, from our perspective, it will really come down to what value does, does um, a target acquisition bring to us. Um, but we're very focused on both organic growth and you know, where we think we can find value in M&A, which maybe diversifies our earnings brings us um, a capability that we don't have or a technology capability that we don't, we don't have, we'd certainly look at that. I think the other piece for us is as we build out this digital platform and it's cloud-based, it enables us to partner. So rather than acquisition, you know, there will be opportunities to partner with global players that uh, have built uh, strong capability or niches in particular technologies or in particular banking services or financial services that what we might be able to plug into our process as well. So we, we're on the lookout always, but the team's very focused today on performance and, and integrating the, uh, the bank. Before we move on, I, I want to ask you about ESG alongside corporate governance, no doubt one of the core topics being discussed at a board level. What, what, when you're reflecting on some of those board conversations, how important is ESG and what are some of the considerations that you're making? Yeah, look, I would say it's at least in the top three to five issues that we deal with on the board every day. Um, and I think the, the E and the S increasingly, uh, you know, governance is a given. You know, boards are, you know, obviously have to have strong compliance and governance across what we do. But if you think about our employees and our customers, the E and the S is so important to them. I mean, we've seen it in the electorate with the, uh, the recent uh, election we've just been through in Australia. So, you know, for, from our perspective, um, it's an area that we really do want to differentiate. You know, employees and customers vote with their feet. They want to deal with and work for organisations that have a great purpose and that bring something back to communities um, and do the right thing. So uh, we've actually just changed our purpose. We announced to staff actually this week that uh, our purpose is to build social capital through banking. That's got a very strong E and S component to it. Um, and it's all about ensuring that uh, in everything that we do, we actually think about future generations. Um, so climate's an important part of that. In everything that we do, we are inclusive um, and that we support our customers uh, with their resilience uh, during hard times, but also we support the communities that we operate in. So it's a key part of our program uh, and I think it's a, you know, it's going to be a big differentiator, and it's not a box ticking exercise. You know, I think for, for many corporations that's where it started, but I think across Australia we're seeing boards really focused on this issue and seeing it as a, actually a competitive advantage if you're able to get this right. It must be said you you also, alongside your chairmanship of the Bank of Queensland, you sit on the board of Dexas Funds Management Limited, Adobe Advisory Board, Allianz Australia and the Giant Steps Foundation as well, endowment fund I should say. Let's start with, with Dexas. What are you seeing in, in that space? What, what are the, some of the conversations happening at a, at a board level there? 
Yeah, so look, Dexis is going through a, a major transition in its strategy. Um, so as you know, it started principally as an office, uh, owner of offices with a funds management business where it had direct investment in prime office buildings across Australia, uh, but also managed funds uh, in joint ventures with partners, but also in funds uh, with, with offices. Uh, over the last five years, you've seen increasingly Dexis diversify across sectors in real estate. Um, so it's got large holdings now in industrial properties, it's got large holding, uh, holdings in retail, and it's got large holdings in health. Uh, so uh, it's evolving to be a real estate company uh, across all sectors in real estate in Australia. You know, office has obviously been through a, a very interesting time through COVID. And the, you know, the big questions you know, for the Dexas board is, well, what's the future of office? We are still very confident that the office plays a very important role. And I see this through my other boards as well um, uh, in ensuring that employees um, collaborate uh, that we get innovation uh, through people being together in discussion, that development of people uh, only happens in person as well. So the office space is involving, from that perspective, I think we recognise that uh, clearly uh, we're going to have flexible work practices where people actually work from home and in the office. But the experience in the office is so important to building culture, building good culture and helping companies prosper. I think we also felt that you know, productivity was really good. You know, uh, companies adapted very strongly uh, and very quickly to, to COVID, to working from home, and everyone felt that productivity held. My sense is um, productivity over time um, it will, will falter uh, if we don't have people in person working together. So that balance is really important. So there's a really important role for, for office going forward. I, you know, Dexas's core focus is on prime real estate and ensuring that we have the right assets in the right locations uh, across all of those sectors I spoke about. I think the other big change for Dexas is moving to a funds management business. So you've obviously seen the recent announcement with respect to AMP Capital. Um, so there's infrastructure uh, funds as part of that business as well. So that's more diversification for the group. But you are going to see a company with very strong direct investments in property that it holds on its balance sheet, a very strong development pipeline across all of those sectors that it holds on its balance sheet, and then a growing funds management business, an integrated platform across real estate in Australia. And then what about the Adobe Advisory Board? What, is, what does that role entail? Look, that's a great board to be on. Uh, it's a non-fiduciary role. So uh, we have uh, eight global members on that board. Um, it's very strategic and business orientated. Adobe is a fabulous company. Uh, they are at the forefront of this digital battleground and they're providing the tools to companies to help them in that area. So they, we have you know, three aspects of the business. There's Adobe Creative, which basically provides companies with creative and, and consumers and individuals with creative tools for their websites, but also to, to market their capability. We've got Adobe Document, um, uh, which is the digitalization of documents and signatures and whatever. And then we've got Adobe Data platforms, which is really bringing data from you know, lots of different platforms onto a single platform and automating that, enabling companies to better understand their customers. So it's growing fast. Uh, it's a very innovative company to be part of. And, and I'm really enjoying not having to worry about compliance and governance and focus on the business, yeah. And then Allianz Australia, tell us about that. Yeah, look, Allianz Australia is another very highly regulated uh, industry. It's in the finance industry. Um, it's, you know, uh, the number three player in insurance in Australia. Uh, it has a very large global parent, so it benefits um, from that ownership. But, you know, we have independent directors in Australia, even though we're a subsidiary, because we're regulated locally. Uh, but look, they've got a great business. Uh, they, like the banks, have been through an enormous cultural transformation to respond to Hain. Uh, they also are going through a technology transformation, but it's being supported by a global giant that's got billions of dollars to invest uh, to drive uh, better outcomes for customers. I'll ask you about the, the Giant Steps Endowment Fund shortly. I, I just want to briefly explore your background, though, if I could. You're a graduate of the University of Sydney. Take us through your, your interests in the fields of banking and, and finance and then some of your early experiences within the sector. Sure. So, look, I was born in South Africa. I went to school in South Africa and was very fortunate to come to university here and loved Australia so much I stayed. Um, I, I studied, I did a BA LLB. So I studied law with, with the intention possibly to go into law. 
the Australian banking system was just being deregulated at that time, so it was a time when uh, the Hawke-Keating government uh, deregulated the financial system. Banks were hiring, uh, so I joined Citibank um, in those days, uh, about 1983, um, and it was a fascinating time to be in banking because um, they just floated the currency. Uh, Citibank had just been given a banking licence in Australia, so a number of foreign entrants came into Australia. So it was a huge growth uh, area. And being part of a large global international bank, I had uh, the benefit of actually spending a couple of years in London. Um, so I worked in a financial engineering group in London, which was fabulous, came back to Australia. And then Citibank sent me to North America to run their foreign exchange and derivative sales business for, for North America. Um, so it was a great experience, uh, a great university. Um, Citibank had its own university at those days, so um, uh, we used to go and attend um, fabulous courses, so it was a great learning ground. As I understand it, you then found your way to London at, at some point and became Managing Director of Capital Markets and Treasury at Swiss Banking Corporation, the precursor to what is now UBS. Take me through your ascension to this position and, and what living in Europe was like in the, in the 90s. So I was hired out of Citibank. I was living in New York with Citibank, uh, running their business. Um, uh, Swiss Bank uh, had a 10-year plan to be a leading investment bank uh, in the world uh, over a 10-year period. Very Swiss to have those long-term plans. <laughs> Citibank used to change its plans every year, uh, very American. Uh, so they, they hired me to come in and run um, a global business for them. They just bought a, a derivatives trading house in Chicago, which they were integrating into the bank. Um, it was a really exciting time uh, to be part of their investment bank, given their aspirations. And, you know, we went from, you know, being a sort of top 10 player, largely servicing Swiss clients around the world, to be a top three investment bank um, globally. Uh, so it was a great time to be with the organisation. I spent some time in Zurich with them um, and then moved to London and ran the business out of, out of London. Um, and then ultimately, uh, uh, Swiss Bank merged with UBS. And in fact, it was even though they, they took the name UBS, it was almost a reverse takeover where the um, you know, CEO of Swiss Bank became the president of the combined organisation. Um, and obviously the investment bank of Swiss Bank was the core uh, investment banking group. Now, I don't know if you remember, but there was a group called Dominx Barry in Australia. Uh, SBC Dominx Barry uh, was part of that, and that became what is now UBS, and obviously an enormous success in Australia for UBS as an investment bank um, over, the last, uh, over the last decade. And what were, what were some of the deals that you were working on during that, during that time? Yeah, so look, I mean, I, I uh, was fortunate I was running the business. So uh, I had um, uh, about 3,000 people in 16 countries. So I spent a lot of time travelling and on aeroplanes, um, visiting people. Uh, so I wasn't on the deal front uh, focus. It was more managing the business and um, making sure that we had the capability to deliver to our customers. But yeah, we did, um, you know, we were a, a global player. Um, yeah, we did some, some wonderful business uh, across uh, many corporations. Uh, we serviced probably the top thousand institutional investors in the world as well. So it was great to be able to bring corporates and investors together to do fabulous deals that enhanced value for both. As I understand it, in 2002 you then co-founded Saltbush Capital Markets. What, what are the origins of that business? What were the origins of that business and, and what were some of the services that you offered? So I came back uh, to Australia, um, decided that uh, I wanted to work for myself, took a little bit of time out and with a couple of friends um, we set up uh, Saltbush and there, there were sort of two origins of that. We wanted to provide absolute returns to investors. Um, through investing in, in equities. And so we were a, a manager of managers, so we, we bought three or four fund managers into the group. Uh, they owned their own businesses. We took an equity share in their business and we raised capital for them and provide the financial services license and compliance across those umbrellas. And we had a corporate advisory business as well. Um, so uh, we, we grew well, uh, but the GFC, uh, like it did for many businesses, really uh, hurt our funds management business. Uh, we'd got to about $350 million on the management at that stage. Um, and we had redemptions across the board. We didn't put a gate down like many businesses did in the GFC. And everyone wanted liquidity. So we went down under $100 million of funds management and ultimately got to a stage where we just felt we didn't have the scale 
uh, for the compliance cost uh, to run that business. So uh, we sold off our management companies and kept the corporate advisory business, uh, which I stayed on and ran um, for about three or four years. And that's actually how I got onto the Fairfax board, uh, because I was an advisor to Fairfax during that really disrupted period where they had a lot of debt um, and uh, we're finding that um, you know, uh, earnings uh, were being significantly disrupted as uh, they lost their classifieds to, to digital sites. Mm, absolutely. And, what, and to just reflecting on that, on that period, so I think you joined the Fairfax board in 2016 or, or thereabouts, yeah. obviously a period of significant turmoil for the media industry. What were, how did you manage to sort of stabilise or how did the board manage to stabilise the business during that yeah. period? Look, I mean, I, so I was an advisor to Fairfax before, so it was actually uh, great to be able to come onto the board knowing the business so well. And, you know, enormous credit to Greg Highwood uh, for his bold leadership during that period. But I think there were sort of probably four really, really important um, aspects that uh, they need to respond to. They had too much debt um, at the time. Earnings were in decline and declining significantly. There were double digit declines in earnings every year. Uh, they had lost. Uh, the car and jobs classifieds to online sites, which actually became more valuable than Fairfax, um, and hadn't responded to, to, to that. And so I think the response was absolutely key. How do we, uh, and, and this was driven by Greg, uh, but basically how do they actually reduce the debt? So they sold off some non-core assets to reduce the debt. They owned a, a business called Trade Me in New Zealand, which uh, David Kirk, when he was CEO, had bought. Uh, that uh, grew to considerable value, but they felt that the growth uh, in New Zealand was uh, at a point where it probably couldn't grow much further. And whilst it was a fabulous digital asset, um, uh, that really saved the company uh, in terms of uh, selling that off um, and, and repaying the debt. Uh, so, and they sold off some other non-core assets as well. They closed the printing presses, which was a really bold move. Um, you know, the cost, uh, they took about $660 million of cost out of the business, uh, but the two big printing presses in Melbourne and Sydney were, were shut down. Uh, they set up a digital uh, platform outside the media business as a disruptor to the media business, uh, and eventually transferred all the journalists and the media business onto the digital platform. They took uh, domain out of the media business and separated it with a separate culture uh, realised that, that that had to be a digital company um, and uh, eventually listed Domain but retained 60% ownership of, of Domain as a, as a growth asset and then invested in the startup and Stan, um, uh, you know, recognising that on-demand video streaming was a huge opportunity. Netflix were in a fairly dominant position in Australia but there wasn't another player in Australia. Always felt there was room for a number two. Um, so in a joint venture with Nine, started Stan from scratch and that's been obviously a fabulous success story. So, you know, I, I think they sort of moved from a, uh, a print-based business to, you know, 70 to 80 percent of their uh, content being read online. Uh, so very much a digital business with some fabulous digital growth assets, but the two core ones have been Domain and, and Stan. You also sat on the board of Macquarie Goodman, now known just as, as Goodman Group, one of the world's largest industrial property firms. What was your involvement with this organisation? Yeah, so look, I was fortunate to be an early part of that when it was a joint venture with Macquarie. I mean, Greg, Greg Goodman had great foresight uh, that uh, prime land uh, close to major um, infrastructure uh, was going to facilitate industrial warehouses and the growth uh, of obviously the, uh, the online economy uh, would accelerate that. Um, so they started relatively small. They were backed uh, basically by the Goodman family and Macquarie. Uh, so there was a management company that was set up and then a property trust that owned the assets. So I sat on the board of the property trust uh, and ultimately um, it made sense to staple those two organisations together. I mean, there were many, too many conflicts of um, you know, management company very focused on this management fees uh, and a property trust which wanted prime assets uh, and didn't want to grow just for the sake of growing to grow management fees. So the stapling of those two groups really formed uh, what you see now today as Goodman Group. Uh, so I was on that board for five years, uh, pre-GFC, came off because Saltbush was competing with Macquarie on 
some things and I felt there were some conflicts uh, in my salt bush role to being on that board. But uh, I joined that board at the age of 35. Um, so it was a great time to be, to be on the board and, and as a young uh, person on the board, um, learned a lot from David Clark, who was uh, the chair of, of, of that organisation. Uh, fabulous people skills. But uh, they had great foresight. They got themselves in a bit of trouble in the GFC um, and had, had a near-death experience. Had too much debt and obviously when property values go down and you've got too much debt, banks get very nervous. Uh, but they have re recovered remar remarkably. They're a top 20 listed company in Australia. They are the major owner of industrial assets around the world. And industrial cap rates um, are at uh, ridiculously low levels, uh, which has built some great wealth for, for Goodman shareholders. So banking, media, property, must also say that you were also on the board of, of Woolworth South Africa for a period of, of some five years from 2014 to 2019. So, so let's talk about retailing and the retail industry. How, how did you see the retail industry transform over that period and how did you see the, the Woolworths group respond to that? So look, I mean, retail's been through very similar disruption to, to media. They're probably the two industries that were hit earliest uh, with, uh, with disruption. And um, you know, retail uh, now has 25% you know, roughly, I think, uh, of sales online. Um, obviously in food uh, consumables it's less, uh, but that disruption has um, certainly undermined a number of players in the industry if they haven't adapted to that. And so I think the key issue for Woolworths, but also for, for all retails is, uh, previously you expanded your business by growing your footprint. Um, so just opening up new stores in new locations. Uh, and, you know, that just doesn't work anymore. Um, you know, I think the fastest growth in the sector is online. Uh, clearly the consumer wants that personal experience when they're in the store and they want a fabulous experience when they're in the store, but they also want to be able to shop uh, online as well. So getting that balance right is absolutely key. You know, I think for most retailers, they've been caught with too large a footprint. Uh, probably didn't respond early enough to reducing that footprint with quite a big overhead um, in lease liability. Now for many large uh, retailers they tend to be anchor tenants uh, in centres, so those leases were 10 to 20 years. For the smaller retailers they're 4 to 5 years, uh, so they run off a bit easier. So managing um, that liability is really, really difficult in the current environment. Um, so I think you know, as we look at um, department stores in particular, um, you know, their footprints are too large, they've got long lease liabilities uh, and it's a really, really cha big challenge for them to uh, basically have that runoff. At the same time, they're looking to grow their business online and, uh, you know, the, as I said before, companies like Adobe are working very closely with retailers to ensure that that interface with the customer is a seamless, frictionless experience when they deal with you online. You've been very generous with your time, so I just want to finish with a few more general questions. You've had an extraordinary career, which we've explored this morning. What are the, the key ingredients required for success? Look, I, I would say um, be respectful and humble, uh, no matter who you are. Um, and that's really, really important uh, across whatever you do. Um, I think resilience is, is key. Um, you are going to go through difficult times and um, learn from those experiences um, and bounce back. Uh, being courageous, you do need to take risk and be bold, uh, but you need to take calculated risks and, and thoughtful risks. But it's important that um, you do need to be bold. And I think the final thing is question the status quo. Basically don't think that things are going to stay the same because we're in a fast evolving uh, environment for both companies, the economy uh, and consumers. and. Um, You've got to constantly question how you can do things better, what's changing, where's disruption coming from, and how do we respond to that? As someone who has been deeply embedded within media businesses previously, what do you see traditional media organisations will need to be doing into the future to remain sustainable, or do you think they're on a sustainable footing as is? Look, I think there are some that are on a sustainable footing. I think there are some that, that uh, might not make it. I mean, ultimately, for many businesses, it comes down to quality content. Uh, so that's absolutely core. So ensuring that you invest in the capability to produce quality content. 
Uh, and then I think that the, the layer across that is you know, providing the consumer or the end user um, a frictionless experience to access that content across whatever channel they want to deal with you on. Um, so, and whenever they want to deal with, whenever they want to interact with you. So the days of you know, free-to-air television where you, you're available to watch the six o'clock news are gone. You know, people want to get the news all day, 24-7, whenever they want it, on the channel that's best for them. Uh, so you know, I think when you think about your audience, uh, providing that seamless 24-7 channel with really, really good content uh, is absolutely key. Obviously, advertising is a key component of that. Uh, advertisers will follow audience. Um, so, you know, we're seeing through the air television audience in decline. And, uh, you know, we're seeing audiences grow on other channels. And so those media companies that actually are able to um, provide that interface across all channels um, is absolutely key. And I think that's why Nine is, is you know, in such a strong position. The, the merger of Fairfax and Nine really brought all of those aspects together. They've got radio, they've got free-to-air television, they've got on-demand streaming, um, they've got the print media, um, and then they've got the digital um, sort of interfaces. So I think um, you know, having uh, that cross-section across um, uh, your audience is, is very, very important. You did touch on it earlier, but are there any key pieces of advice that you can share or key lessons that you've learnt throughout your career that you can pass on? Look, I think I touched on, on it in terms of the comments around what's important. You know, my, my sense is that um, we are all going to have challenges in our life from time to time. Uh, so don't expect the milk to spill. Um, uh, but be resilient. You know, uh, respond, be persistent, uh, be authentic, um, follow your, your gut um, and have conviction uh, rather than sitting on the fence uh, and be bold. What's next for Patrick Galloway? Uh, <laughs> look, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing at the moment. I, I love chairing the bank and I'm very excited about where the bank's going and, and I enjoy my other board roles. But I do want to, to potentially sail around the world, um, uh, at least do the Pacific. Uh, so uh, that's a little way off yet. I've got a lot to do before I get there. Uh, but that's a, a, a longer term aspiration. Patrick Galloway, absolute privilege having you on the program. Thanks so much for your time. That's a pleasure, Rob. Nice to, nice to spend time with you. Thank you.